Okay, I want to keep going on to show you some things. Okay, see this here? I'm jerk. This is the Codex Biza that I was talking about. It's in the 5th century. And this is a comparison in Bible works of the main, most important copies of the text and how they differ. Like, see this funky thing that looks like an N? That's actually a Hebrew letter A. Aleph. Aleph. You almost never say it out loud. You just, you just uh, in your throat. And what it does is see, this is a comparison. In this case from Mark 13.2 of the text and then where it differs in some other manuscript see down here they show what the differences are so you can see them at a glance you have no idea how hard it was to make that it took thousands and thousands of hours and thousands of people through centuries to compile all this because basically the Bible has been kidnapped for most of its life ever since it got written especially you know the New Testament which is kind of what we're looking at here I see this right here right here right along here that's I'm in Lego who I mean that means believe it when I tell you it's in Mark see see wait a minute well, let me go in. It won't let me go in. It won't let me actually put this marker over it. You see, you go. So you have to put it there, but you can just see it here. If I go, if I get rid of this, you can see it in easier to read type, like right here. All right. But all these other manuscripts, which are the big ones. They don't have Amen Lego Homi in it, in this verse. They have it in another verse at the end, but not in this one. So in order to see it at all, you have to go here. And it's right along here. I see that says Amen Lego Homi. And this is a misspelling. So we know that the later scribe did it because that wasn't a word when Mark was alive. It wouldn't have the E in it. The word was existed, but it didn't have an E in it. But, as you can see, it's part of, see, they write in these long columns. And then they write the next line. And as you can see, this one is, is paying some attention to the clauses. These are clauses, like the way I broke this out right here. See, clause. That's what's so cool about it. Because I've been looking for proof that somebody knew what I'm showing you on screen back, you know, centuries ago. And in a way, you can see it. See, this is all by itself. I'm in Lego Homie. All by itself. And so, I list it all by itself. Now, the guy who made that copy... didn't know that the writers of scripture paid attention to syllable counts. They didn't know anything about this back when, you know, the church was um, like 200, 300 years old. They used to know when, when these writers wrote, they wrote by syllable counts. As you can see here, because it's the same syllable count that is used in Matthew as I've shown you in prior videos and Luke as I've shown you in prior videos okay but the person who made this copy did not know okay he, did, he didn't know and yet it stands all by itself now that means that the person who made this copy you're looking at this is the actual manuscript that Theodore Beza had this copy that you're looking at is actually from the 400s AD and whoever made this copy was copying from something else that was broken up just like this okay made it like that 
because they're copying from something they see and they had to do it by hand. So what that tells you right away is that whatever they were copying from is really old. And that whatever they were copying from did know about syllable counts. Because see, it's on its own. It's a clause. You're supposed to do this syllable counting thing by clause. Okay? So somebody, when they first, you know, got it from Mark, counted the syllables like I'm doing here, and then put I'm in Lego who mean from Mark on the next clause, because grammatically that's how it should be done. And then somebody wrote it out, and it looked like this. This is my smoking gun proof that once upon a time, but not at the time this copy was made, once upon a time, somebody knew to do what I'm doing here. Somebody knew it. Because they put it on a separate line. Like I'm doing here. See, it's not like a marginal note or somebody making a comment about the same thing in somebody else. In Matthew, this is actually part of the Mark text. All right? But it only exists right here in a copy of Theodore Beza who took over from Calvin. He's the only guy we can find so far that has this. Okay, for Mark. But here's your proof that what I'm doing, somebody else was doing the same thing centuries upon centuries ago. Okay, now I didn't break all the clauses the way they do because they had some kind of idea about how long they're supposed to make it and they had rules about you know because this stuff is really expensive this is actually skin of an animal okay so that would determine kind of like how long they could make it and they'd want to use as much of the space as they could but obviously there was some kind of rule that they were following or some kind of copy they were following to put this on a line all by itself because that's not the way most manuscripts were made back then. See, like this one, as I showed you before, this is Sinaiticus. See, the verses are all just running into each other. This is this is Mark 2, okay, and it goes on and on, see. And you can see it's written on both sides because the, the skin of the animal is really thin. They have to press it and process it and they had to do a whole lot of stuff. This is from like the 300s, the 300s AD. And this stuff here is a note by whoever was doing the proofing about what they proofed or who it was and stuff like that there. But see, they don't pay any attention at all to the words or anything like that. They're just copying one letter at a time in order to make this nice cute column. Here, let me zoom it out so you can see. See? They're columns on a really large skin. Animal skin. See, look. I forget if this is called a choir or a folio. It's, they got special names for these things. They're not pages. And it goes on and on and on. See? And as you can see, there was some water damage or fire or something. This is the actual stuff. Okay, the text you see up here, this up here, well, unfortunately, uh, Bible Works decided that they want to make it unreadable blue. That's a transliteration of this stuff, which is all in capital letters, doesn't have any of those markings or anything on it. This is how they made the actual copies of what the apostles actually wrote and they use these big capital letters and all the letters run into each other okay can you imagine having to read that you go blind I, I don't know what idiot decided this is a good way to make a copy to read but obviously they wanted to make it look pretty rather than be readable okay but that's what it looked like so now again let's go back to Biza because his is really different. See, look at it. Here's I'm in Lego, who means pretty readable. You just have to learn that they're, they're 
what their letters look like were different from these letters up here. But see, somebody was paying attention to the lines. And some of the lines are short and some of them are long. Okay, that implies really strongly, right here especially, that what I'm doing right here is the way it ought to be done. And somebody is especially paying attention to the fact that this ought to be on its own line. Okay? So, understand that it took thousands and thousands of people involved for you to be able to even see this. Okay? It took a whole year to make one of these Bibles because you had to do it by hand. And this is one of the better ones because, it, because of the way they, they parse it. Okay? But still they run all the letters together. And that's how they did the other ones. Let's see, the Vatican. Is. Here's the one that was at the Vatican. This was a little more readable. See, they start to use the marks there. Okay. This could be a later copy of the, you know, early text. Because the text is also 300s. But it looks like it's a later hand. It might not be. Okay, see? See, that's what it looks like. And that's skin. That's not paper. That's skin. That's animal skin. So, well, it looks like it blocked. Looks like I can't get it to, to work now. Alright, no image found for this verse. Now this one's a little, this one's old too. Look! Look how horrible! Alright, this one's so old. This is like uh, also, 300s, 400s. See? Look at that. How can you read that? So they did not know. They did not know about this. Because they're copying in columns. That's all they know is copy one letter after the next letter. Alright? Now, the other thing I wanted to show you. This is Bible Works 9. Uh, they got a later version now, but it's essentially the same. Um, I did a lot of customization to mine. So yours wouldn't look exactly like this, but you can do the same kind of customization to yours that I have. But, see this one. I customized it so only certain Bibles would show it in a certain order and you can make it be in any order you want. And you can customize it to show any order you want. This is in Aramaic because sometimes that's better. This is in Aramaic with Hebrew letters, sometimes that's better. The New Testament was not written in Aramaic nor in Hebrew. These are actually Hebrew letters, not actual Hebrew. Okay, it was written in Greek. And one of the reasons why you know that is because, again, of these syllable counts. If you're beginning to get the idea that syllable counts are really important to proving what the Bible actually is and what the writer wrote, and in what language and at one time, that's exactly what I hope you're getting out of this. Okay, because they didn't know to do this. See? How much different is that from those columns you saw? Okay, how much different is that? It's pretty. And pretty unreadable, too. Actually, these letters, Jesus would not have been able to read those letters. They didn't exist in his day. This, these letters were actually invented, like, in the 13th century. But they're, they're you know, copies of other letters. In other words... This olive did not exist in Jesus' day. It didn't look like that. But there was something that was the A. Okay? Same thing for the Greeks. See, when we look at this, well, okay, I get that. Alright? But that's not what the text looks like in the actual books that were made at the time. That's what I want you to understand. And then they have abbreviations, like that's the abbreviation for Jesus. Okay? And you learn how to read those things. But these are like the, the biggest manuscripts that they have. 
And you get all that in Bible Works if you want it. It's all part. It's all built into the price. Not only that, but these are like the Vulgates. This is the Vulgate that's online, and you can actually look up. I don't know if you can do it with the Vulgate. I haven't. I don't usually read the Latin with the, a dictionary. Um, no, you can't. They don't have any version of the Vulgate that shows you the text. But here you can see, like. See, that's the word for Jesus, Jesus. Okay, some Greek purists will say e Jesus. Okay, but that's not how they pronounced his name when he was here. Because ye is the Hebrew. So ye would be the sound of that. Alright, so that's Jesus said. And it's telling you that it, the what the word is. See, it been. And then this is the, the vocabulary form of the word. And then these are these are what are called dictionaries that are part of it. So that I can, if I don't remember a word, you know, like let's say I, I didn't remember what tautas meant. Okay, well, now I can look it up. And here's Gingrich Dictionary that's built in. Freiburg that's built in. I don't use those two very much. This one you have to pay extra for. Bauer, Danker, Arndt, and Gingrich. And all these, a lot of these are like over 100 years old. But the reason why you have to pay for them is that, you know, it's a lot of hard work to stick all this stuff into computer. Okay, the richest people in the Old Testament, the richest people in the New Testament, the richest people from 100 years ago could not get what you see on screen. In other words, like Thomas Jefferson could read the Bible in Greek. So could Webster. So could Theodore Roosevelt. But they couldn't get it this easy. They'd have to spend years and years and years memorizing, you know, the conjugation of verbs and stuff like that in order to read this. I didn't have to do that. I just got this. See? Oh, I don't remember what the accusative case is. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's Tautas, feminine, accusative case of Hutas. And then here's what it is. It's a demonstrative pronoun. This, that. Okay? And then this guy, this is one of the better lexicons. Much better than Strong. Strong's is weak. That, that give, goes into a lot of detail about it. And then says, hi, here's the meaning. Here's the verses where you can see that meaning used. Okay? And they use a lot of abbreviations, but you get used to them. And it goes on and on and on and on and on. So you'll know everything you ever want to know about Hutas. Okay. Then there's another guy. This is Liddell Scott. He's um, dead too. And this has to do with um, more classical Greek. And that matters because classical Greek was very popular in Jesus' day. It's not getting enough attention. Everybody says, Koine, Koine, Koine means common. Yeah, Koine, common. But they didn't just talk in that way. It's like I can suddenly speak with a more erudite voice or use more formal language. Oh, I can talk like this if I want. See? But this is my favorite one. This is over 100 years old. You can get it free online. Thayer. What's neat about Thayer is first of all he compares it to the Hebrew which is really important. Secondly, as he goes into where the word comes from. And you need that, especially with Mark. Because he plays on, he plays on sound. He plays on origins of words. Actually, all the Bible writers do that. Alright? So this is, great buildings. Megalas. Oikodomas. Okay? And you can find out, well, ooh, what's an oikodomas? See, because it's not just any old building. Sometimes it's a big building, a little building, the official building, a house. What kind of building is a building? So then you look at all these, you know, dictionaries and stuff to find it. But you just hover your mouse over the word, and that's how you can find it. Now, Bible Works costs about $350. I submit to you that it's worth it. Ask God for the money. You'll tear your hair out the first two to four months learning how to use it. Because there's so many things you can do with it. But, if you want to be able to see this stuff, 
BibleWorks is the only place you can get it with such facility. I mean, you can go see this online. All right, all this stuff is published online. It's in the public domain. But honey, see, you can't do that online. You can't do that online. It's easier to use this text and to see how hard they worked at making it. Okay? The other thing you get that I want to, to see is like when you're in a verse, it's like, well, what verses relate to it? Well, here's some. It's not all of them. There are different kinds of cross-references, like if you want the NIV or you want the NAB or you want the Thompson Change reference or my favorite, which is this one. But BibleWorks older version had a better, better deal, but not this one. But it's still helpful, okay? The other thing is, is that like, what if you wanted to um, make notes? Okay, well, you can, you can do your own notes here, and you can paste tags, you know, like copy, and then if I want to paste it. I don't know what that was. I didn't ask for an Adobe Acrobat. I don't know what it just happened. I've never I've never used it in this version. See here we go. Copy selected text. Copy to the editor. Okay. There you go. See? Copied it. And then I can format the text with all these little buttons that tell you what they are. Okay? And then you got all these other things that you can use. I mean, there's just like a thousand tools in here. I did videos on BibleWorks 9 in YouTube, so you can go look them up. But see, like, if I want to learn Aramaic, I can do that. If I want to get backgrounds on the Testament, I can do that. Commentaries, which I'm not too fond of, but a lot of people are. Okay, if I want to learn Greek grammar. This includes being able to pronounce it because they have like little little recordings in these things. Hebrew grammars, maps, okay? And this thing, this is the most important thing for me, okay? It's called CNTTS apparatus. And that's how I learned about this thing with, with Biza. Okay, you come all the way down here. Okay, see this is Mark 13.2, Mark 13.2. And they tell you what all these manuscripts, okay, like some of them have the word Apocrites, Ho Jesus, Epenato. Some of them have Ho Jesus, Apocrites, Epenato. In other words, they reverse the order. That's their variant. In other words, it says the same thing, but it's in different order. That's how persnickety these people have been over the centuries. You cannot imagine that, that what you're looking at on screen is a product of literally millions of people for hundreds of years. Okay? And you got to understand, these people didn't know, didn't know Bible doctrine. They knew basic things like, yes, Jesus paid for your sins. Okay? They knew of arguments between scholars. They know of arguments in the church. They know a lot about church history. But they don't know a lot about what the Bible actually says and what it means. They can read it, and yet they don't know it. That's why Good Friday sticks around as a false doctrine. And yet, look at their hard work that they did. So that you and I can get the doctrine right and learn all this. It's absolute crime if you're not learning the Bible in the original Hebrew and Greek. I'm sorry. It's a crime. It's unfair to all their hard work when they spent so much time working hard that they didn't get a chance to actually learn it. It's like your mom and your dad, <clears throat> maybe they worked as a grocery clerk or they worked as a bartender or they worked as a fireman so that you could go and become a scholar. Okay, behold the scholar. And this is all scholarly work, all right, but it's not scholarly work that ends up in understanding Bible. It's on the Bible and about the Bible and providing the Bible like cooking food, but they never ate it. So 
if you want to honor the scholars and the thousands upon thousands of monks who kept on thinking Good Friday was valid and yet here they are actually reading the Hebrew and Greek and they don't know any better. You want to honor them and their hard work otherwise you couldn't have this Bible at all? Then learn it. Peace out.